Hello. Welcome to my sample video for my presentation that I have affectionately and perhaps a bit irreverently titled, Why Executives Don't Listen. And the hook there is that that might get one to think intuitively that this is going to be about talking about the faults of others, and in fact the opposite is true. I'm not here to tell you uh, about how executives or employees or other people are at fault. In fact, I'm trying to do the opposite, and that is there are things that we should consider some counterintuitive explanation for business behavior that we should consider before we jump to the conclusion that someone else is at fault. Because there might be very valid reasons, sometimes good reasons, sometimes not necessarily good reasons, but reasons nonetheless that we should consider before we start faulting others. This is a, a good presentation for really a broad business audience. It's, it's going to be mostly business specific but it's not specific to any certain functional area. This isn't necessarily a, a training presentation. What I've done is I've drawn some of my thoughts and my experiences from probably the traditional fields of organizational behavior or uh, office politics, if you will, and, and put down some, ex some very reasonable explanations for some difficult situations that I think the, uh, the workers should consider before they, uh, they jump to any rash conclusions that could be damage their relationships with others or, or damage their careers. So with that in mind, let's get started. My first, uh, the first example I want to talk about is drawn obviously from the, uh, the working title here, Why Executives Don't Listen. And the first intuition might be, well, if they're not listening, they might be bullheaded, they might, they might be out of touch, but that's probably the last thing you want to consider. You want to, you want to cross off all of the other possibilities, and these are some of those other possibilities. Um, that's not to say that executives aren't ever bullheaded or out of touch, but that's the, probably the most uh, corrosive conclusion to draw, and so you should draw that last. The first example I say is there might be constraints or consequences that the executives face and that the executives are aware of that you, as the worker, don't see. And I'll give you an example for that. I was doing a, uh, when, when I was at uh, uh, working in the auto industry, one of the employees, we all had to do a uh, a training for our career management. It was a required for every employee. And I had in my department an employee who was a, about six months away from retirement. And he says, this is a total waste of my time. I don't know why they're having me do this because I'm so close to retirement, I, I don't really need a lecture on career management. And what was actually happening there is that there were consequences that he didn't understand. What would have happened if he had, if they had allowed him to opt out of the training, that would have opened the door to a variety of people for, for making reasons not to go. And oftentimes we were in a, we're, we were in a very challenged environment, it was, the time was a real constraint for us, and so managers would have immediately started coming up with excuses not to pay people, to, not to send people to training because they would rather keep them there fighting fires. Uh, this was a manufacturing environment, very, very stringent, tightly run organization. And what would have happened is that they would have sort of opened the door at all to ex uh, excuses for not going to training. Lots of people who actually would need the training would, would be going. And so what that individual, that near retiree didn't understand is that there were consequences uh, that, he, that other people might end up missing the training who needed it that he didn't see. And so it, it actually made sense if you looked at it in the big picture. He just didn't see the big picture there. Um, it's also important to note that another reason executives might not listen is they might have to weigh your message with a lot of other ones. If you are constantly going to your management with the problems that you face uh, day in and day out, you might understand that they have to weigh that against all of the constraints they face. A, a good example of this is when I worked at a, a Fortune 500 company, we were a global company, and uh, I was working on the strategic plan, and all of the Re, all of the, uh, the different geographies would put forth their requests for investment and, the, and oftentimes those were not taken very seriously. And the reason it, that was is not because the executives were out of touch, but because all of the regions wanted to exaggerate the upside potential in their, in their region so that they could get greater resources and that would sort of end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. All of a sudden they would be doing well because they got the resources, but to get the resources they had to create the illusion that the market was really big. Now if you were a new executive, junior executive in charge of your reason and you told them what you could do with that investment, it might be confusing to you. Why wouldn't they give me what I asked for? I could have done a really great job with that. You, and be, the reason is you didn't understand that there was a line of people asking for that and historically they had exaggerated what they could get for, for their investment and so yours might not be taken as seriously. That's similar to the next one I bring up which is sometimes there's a priority mismatch. 
if you, uh, when, when you have a problem, when there's something that, that is constantly in the way of your job, it's easy to think that that, it, it's easy to perceive that of great importance to the organization. But the reality is n the, the management, the executives, they have to weigh all of the priorities of the organization. I remember when I worked in the auto industry, there was, there was an example here of someone who was, uh, he worked in the, uh, the manual. Uh, he worked for, he developed the documentation, the owner's manuals, essentially for the vehicles. And he was always full of complaints about nobody would listen to him. And the problem he really had is that the truth is nobody buys a car based on how good the owner's manual is. His priority was not one of the highest for the executives. And he failed to, I think, failed to recognize that because it was a, the problems he had were the problems he dealt with every day. And all of these are sort of reasons that you should consider before you jump to the conclusion that your management is out of touch. And one question you might ask is, well, look, if these are sort of reasonable reasons, why don't they tell me that reason? And for that, there are several possibilities that I would, I would assert. One of them is sometimes they don't have a chance. Maybe you don't have direct communication with the people who are, who are rejecting it. Maybe it's actually you who hasn't been proactive in seeking out an understanding. And maybe if you jump to the conclusion that it's because they weren't listening, you either refused to engage them because you thought you already had the answer, or you've engaged them in a negative way and turned them off because you were sort of uh, quasi accusing them of being out of touch. And so that's one reason that they, they might not tell you is because there just hasn't been a, a, a cooperative opportunity to. Another reason might be they're concerned about your motivation, they're concerned about offending you. Specifically, if, if what you're doing here with the owner's manual of a car isn't that important, they're hesitant to tell you, well, I'm not really going to weigh what you have to say because you're an afterthought in the organization. And that's, that's something that they, they, they really don't, that's a conversation they don't want to broach. And the last one, and oftentimes what I found to be the most common, at least when it comes to misunderstandings, is there might be political constraints. So, for example, even if, even if there is a, they are functionally responsible for this area, there might be political reasons they, that, that exceed the sort of functional org chart uh, chain of command that they can't do it. And so they really don't want to uh, openly talk about it because they don't think there's anything they can do about it. The other possibility is they don't think they'll realistically get the resources for it, so the conversation about it isn't very productive. And sometimes they might not even want to acknowledge that there's a problem because if they do, they'll feel responsible. The, the, the expectation is that the organization can't, uh, will, will ask them to fix it even though they know for political or resource constraints they can't. A good example of that is when I was working in an auto industry, I wasn't actually an executive here, but I was a member of management. I was the, the engineer uh, working on the assembly line and one of the men uh, one of the operators was doing his assembly line operation using the improper sequence. And so what I would like, and it was faster, but it was a compromise to the equipment and the quality of the vehicle. So what I wanted to do as the engineer is get him to do it the right way. And then, but it turns out I didn't have the ability to do that because he didn't answer to me. He answered to his supervisor and we lived in a, worked in a plant with a strong uh, union and, and really the, the supervisors didn't have the authority to, to aggravate all of their operators and the uh, supervisor wasn't doing anything about it. So I couldn't do much about it. My other alternative would have been, well, if he's going to save time, I'm going to rewrite his job because I was in charge of the sort of the, the work content of the job. I'm going to put more work on him. But then that would put me in a, in a position of liability because now I am in a situation where I'm, I'm telling, essentially instructing, writing the instructions for the job to do it in a way that compromises quality and, uh, and of the equipment in the vehicle. So in reality, nothing really happened there. It never got fixed. He continued to do it the wrong way and, uh, and uh, I kept it written the right way, so he was defended uh, against having any more work put on him even though he was underutilized there. Um, so anyway, those are some ex things you should consider before you jump to the conclusion that your, your management is at fault. Let me talk about a few reasons why, uh, let's flip the coin, shall we say, let's, let's turn the tables and look at the other side. This is sort of why workers might think their uh, executives are out of touch. This is, let, now let's talk about why executives might think that their workers are out of touch. Um, oftentimes you'll, you'll hear an executive complaining or a manager complaining, you know, I ask things to be done and they never seem to be done the way I ask them or, uh, you know, I ask people to share more information and they don't seem to. What, why is that? It must be because I have a problem with my workers. Well, that's again, 
possible, but probably the last thing you should consider. I would recommend you look at several other things before then, and oftentimes things that are more easily under your control. And the first one I bring up is, perhaps you're not leading by example. And if you're not setting an example that you take these things seriously, that your employees will be less receptive to do so. I'll give you an example of that. Here uh, in Las Vegas during the financial crisis, the, a lot of the casinos were in a difficult financial position and there was one of the CEOs of a, of a gaming company, a casino company, who came out and said, uh, well, you know, obviously people are our most important assets. And then a month after that, he laid off a bunch of people and then a month after that, he bought another casino property because they were cheaper. Now my position on that is, well, look, Obviously, people aren't your most important asset if you're getting rid of people to add properties. Obviously, the casino properties are the most important asset. Now, we all know why he says that. He says that because people can get their feelings hurt and casinos don't. But the reality is there was an inconsistency there in that message. And that's why uh, uh, I, think he, uh, the, the, I think the people would notice that. And so the next time he goes to the people and talks about shared sacrifice or ask them to share more information with him, they're going to be less consist they're going to be less likely to be cooperative because he's shown himself to be inconsistent in his commitment to them. Um, it's also important to note that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be inconsistent. Sometimes there's a waiting to see element of that as well. For example, Oftentimes, an executive will come out and let's say there's the opportunity to do something shady in the business, something uh, lacking ethical standards, uh, coercive, whatnot, illegal maybe even, and the executive comes out and says, well, look, we're not doing anything shady. We're, we're following the rules. We're going to take it seriously. A, a lot of employees will, will take that at face value, but some of the particularly savvy political, uh, some of the politically savvy employees might say, well, let's let's see what actually happens and if there's if there's managers who are actually doing shady things and they're the ones getting promoted we might not take that seriously we might assume that that's inconsistent because the politically savvy employees will know that publicly that's something that has to be said and so they're going to wait before they go along with what he's asking to see if if that's not just what he's saying publicly but if how he or she is acting uh, in private as well and um an, uh, the, the, there's another example I want to use sort of in terms of uh, the wait and see. If you look at uh, the Chinese uh, Cultural Revolution, there was a, a leader who came out and said, let a thousand flowers bloom. Technically it was a hundred flowers. He got misquoted. But the, the point is, he, he wanted to, what he meant by that is, let's have everybody come out and be open about criticizing the government. And a lot of people said, this isn't really a change of heart. This is uh, a, a, a trap to find out who doesn't support the government and pr imprison or execute them. And in fact, that's what happened. A lot of the critics were, were executed. And so the, the, the politically savvy ones who adopted the wait and see attitude were the ones who lived to tell about it. So that's one reason why your employees might not be listening to you, might not be taking your statements and commitments at face value. They're looking for behaviors. The last one I want to talk about for the sample here is that if they've tried in the past, they might not have been rewarded by that. Um, I've oftentimes uh, worked with some managers or executives who like to say, you know, we need to, people need to bring me the problems, I need to know what's going on, and I've seen people, employees, bring those executives, those managers problems, and the manager says, yeah, that's a problem, you need to do something about that, tell me how you've done about it next week. So in other words, if people brought forth a problem in the hopes of getting resources, but they haven't gotten more resources, they've just now told the boss what to watch for, what to, what to look over their shoulder for, people are going to stop having that cooperative relationship with what, what the executive force asks for. So those are some reasons why employees might not listen. And then the last one I want to talk about in the sample here is uh, the common refrain, you know, so-and-so, he or she forgot where they're from, they, they've lost touch with us. And the intuition there is that perhaps they, are, they think they're better than us, they think that, that, that somehow we are, uh, we are to be judged as, as, um, as, as not worthy of their attention. And there are, that's possible again, but there are a couple things you should consider first. And I'll give you a couple examples. One of them is perhaps if they've left your part of the organization, your company, your industry, your neighborhood, they have interests and lifestyles and that are no longer shared with you and now they're sharing them with the people in their new occupation, their new organization, their new neighborhood. And 
how is this different than simply they think they're better for, than us? They might not necessarily think they're better. They're not necessarily judging you. It's just that it's a difference in their life. They have a different lifestyle, different tastes, different occupations. They enjoy re uh, relating to people who have the same position that they have just because they have more in common. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a snob thing. And the last one I want to talk about is there's something called Dunbar's number. And this is a, a uh, uh, an anthropologist named Dunbar came up with this concept that we can only have a certain number of, of, de of uh, reasonably close relationships in our life. That number is usually stated at about 150. I've heard 147. Some people give it a range like between uh, low 100s and the low 200s. But the point is, one of the reasons they might seem like they're forgetting where they're from is not because they don't value you anymore, it's just that they only have so much bandwidth. And the, the uh, Dunbar, the anthropologist, thought this was a, a mental thing, that, that the brain is only capable of uh, managing that many relationships. Others have posited that perhaps it's a sort of bandwidth communication thing, uh, that you just don't have time to keep track of more people than that. And, but that is somewhat belied by the fact that this hasn't changed much despite a significant improvement in communications technology. We've got, uh, you know, first we had uh, long distance telephone rates come down and now we have cell phones and we have smartphones and we have email and now we have social networking. And most of the studies that have been done say that that, that actually stays pretty reasonably close. So if someone has moved on from your industry, company, functional area, uh, geographic region, it's, it, it might be that they just only have so much bandwidth and they have to focus that on, on where they are now. It's not necessarily uh, an, an instance of condescension. And you might say, well, what about people on Facebook with thousands of friends or something like that? And what you usually find, the studies have found, is even if they have thousands of friends, they really only keep touch with uh, 100 or 200 of them on a, on a really regular, intimate basis. So anyway, that's uh, a little bit about this presentation that I've developed. It's, uh, uh, hopefully you found it informative, and if you'd like to see something this presented at your organization or your event, please let me know. I'd be happy to prepare a proposal for you. I look forward to working with you, and thank you.